Greetings brothers from around the world. My name is Jason Dimitri and I want to welcome every one of you to the men's session of the very first ever virtual World Missions Jubilee. It's an honor to be with you guys at this time. You know, we've all gone through so much over the last months with the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic and it's turned our lives around in many ways. But we serve a God who turns tragedy into triumph. And even during this time, we have seen his kingdom continue to advance by planting new churches, raising up more leaders, and growing our local congregations. You know, even right now, everything that's happening in the world, God is using allowing us to come together for this historic occasion. As we have brothers tuning in from Europe and Eastern Europe, we have brothers tuning in from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and mainland China. We have brothers tuning in from the Middle East, brothers tuning in from Africa, brothers tuning in from Central and South America. We have brothers tuning in from North America, Canada, and the United States. It is so incredible to see what God is doing. And I want to start off this session by reading the scripture from Psalm 126. It says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. And I know that that's who is tuning in today. We are the dreamers. We are the visionaries in this year of vision who are going to see the world evangelized in our generation. And it's so incredible to be with you that during the era of COVID-19, that we are seeing the dream of Jesus realized. I love you all so much. And I know that God is going to inspire us all with this incredible men's session. Let's go to our God in prayer. Father, we come before you today knowing that you are right with us, that you know us, that you have a plan for us, not to harm us, to give us hope and a future. God, that you want to work through us, God, to be your vessels, to be your ambassadors, so that we can carry the dream to the four corners of the globe. We are right there with Jesus on the mountain in Galilee in Matthew 28. And he's telling us to go and promising us that he'll be with us to the very end. God, we love you so much. And we pray all these things to you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Greetings, brothers and sisters, to the 2020 World Missions Jubilee. My name is Nick Bordieri, and this is my lovely wife, Denise. And we have the privilege and honor of serving as the leaders of Mercy Worldwide. Please turn with me to Mark 6. The Bible reads, When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick en masse to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, into towns, into the countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all that touched him were healed. Jesus was the true superhero, brought down to earth by God. He loved the people with deep compassion. And wherever he traveled, people would follow him and he would heal them both spiritually and physically. Jesus' heart of compassion, mercy, is the inspiration behind Mercy Worldwide. We're very excited to bring you a mercy moment, good news from around the world. The CSW Mercy Orphanage is very special to us. In 2008, we signed a memorandum of understanding. Our shared vision 
is to raise these children with the heart and the skill to impact not only their generation, but generations to come. The heart behind the CSW Mercy Orphanage is its founder, General Chim Chem, who the children affectionately call Papa. In close partnership with General Chem and CSW, we built and renovated the facilities at the orphanage and established life-changing programs and created an environment that promotes the children's growth and their learning. Together, we have established three pillars of growth and development, character, education, and health. To promote education, we have established English, computer, and art classes. In addition, we have provided much needed medical and dental and established personal hygiene care. To help develop their character, we have also created a campaign called Green and Clean. This is so that the kids can do chores and take personal responsibility for their home. The 58 children at the CSW Mercy Orphanage come from the provinces throughout Cambodia. They are from very poor backgrounds and many are from broken homes. They come to the orphanage to attend school in Phnom Penh and better their lives. We are committed to provide what all children desire, love, kindness, and protection. Quoting Nelson Mandela, education is the most powerful weapon to change the world. Mercy Worldwide believes in education. We've started excitingly the McKean Scholarship Fund, started by our founders in Mercy Worldwide, Kip and Elena McKean, to provide opportunities for underprivileged children to attend universities, vocational schools, and private schools that will, in the future, change a generation. The Mercy School in Jacmel, Haiti, was founded by Jean Bernard and Loverly Collin. We added classrooms, we bought textbooks and school supplies, and we added another grade at the Mercy School in Haiti. We now have 42 students, grades one through four. In this immigrant population, many of the children are undocumented. Consequently, they can't attend the government schools. The El Pasito Mercy School provides educational opportunities for 62 children ages 3 to 18. The Mercy Real School is an amazing story. The founders of the Mercy Real School, Bayadun and Yawanda, are native Nigerians and they love their country. They started the Mercy Real School to educate children in a very poor community. Mercy Worldwide has provided textbooks, school supplies, and rain boots for the muddy walk for the children to go to school. We also have provided food and mosquito nets for their families. Mercy Worldwide built bathroom facilities at the Real School in Okababa. Before this time, they were using plastic bags in an open field. Now, they have functioning toilets, running water, and the parents, the kids, and the teachers are overjoyed. Something we take for granted, like running water, toilet facilities, sanitation conditions, are luxuries for others. Mercy Life Skills started in Los Angeles in 2018 to provide individuals with essential life skills to prosper in this ever-changing world. The five-week program focuses on five key areas of growth and development. 
Number one, integrity. Number two, well-being. Number three, time management and goal setting. Number four, personal finance. And number five, career management. Excitingly, we're expanding the program beyond Los Angeles, now in Miami, and the hope is to expand the program to other cities around the world. Being a worldwide organization, we have the opportunity to be on all six populated continents. And one of the projects near and dear to my heart is the Leprosy Hospital in New Delhi, India. And I know when we arrived there, it was really cool that we could see, uh, we started singing and all the patients came out and they wanted to sing with us and you could just see their eyes light up. The biggest issue today, the pandemic from COVID-19. Individuals, communities, countries, the whole world is impacted by COVID-19. We want to share with you what Mercy Worldwide is doing to actively respond to this pandemic. At the CSW Mercy Orphanage, we're teaching the children the importance of washing their hands and social distancing to prevent the spread of the virus. Mercy Cebu Philippines is producing face shields and PPE suits, providing these to healthcare workers and city officials who are working on the front lines. The Mercy teams in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Lagos, Nigeria, and New York City, to name a few, have launched food drives to provide food for those in greatest need during these very difficult times. Our life skills program has provided a special class to teach the participants how to navigate the unemployment paperwork, apply for government aid, and seek gainful employment during these unprecedented times. We want to take a special moment to acknowledge those on the front lines who are comforting the uncomfortable and risking your lives to save others' lives. You truly are heroes. On behalf of Mercy Worldwide, Denise and I want to thank you for all that you're doing to protect and save so many lives. Mercy is an acronym, Maximizing Efforts for Relief Care and Youth Worldwide. We're so grateful for the opportunity to conduct projects around the world, providing relief and care for so many. Countless lives have impacted by the work of Mercy Ambassadors around the world. Maximizing efforts means partnerships. Without partnerships, we couldn't have done all that we've done throughout the years. We're so grateful for the Red Cross and our partnership with them. We're super excited about our next upcoming event with them, which is going to be a national blood drive in response to the severe shortage of blood due to the pandemic. A special thank you to the International Christian Churches and the Mercy Ambassadors. All that we do would not be possible without you. Your love, your spirit, your compassion is the foundation of mercy and has inspired many around the world to call us the green angels and the green lanterns that light up the world. You truly exemplify compassion in action. Lord, I'm a hard-fighting soldier on the battlefield. Lord, I'm a hard-fighting soldier. Oh, yeah. Lord, I'm a hard-fighting soldier on the battlefield. And I'll be bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I use. I got a helmet on my head and then my hand and sword and shield. I got a helmet on my head and then my hand and sword and shield. I got a helmet on my head and then my hand and sword and shield, and I'll be bringing souls to Jesus by the service that I Lord, give. I'm a hard fighting soldier, don't you know? Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier, oh 
yeah, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. You gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield. You gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right. Oh yeah, you gotta walk right and talk right and sing right and pray right on the battlefield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. I'm a hard fighting soldier. Don't you know, Lord? I'm a hard fighting soldier. Oh, oh yeah, yeah a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. Do you know that Jesus is my captain, and He fights my battle still. He has never lost the battle, and I know He never will. I got the word for my sword, and I got faith for my shield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. I'm a hard fighting soldier. Don't you know, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Oh, oh yeah, Lord, yeah, I'm a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. And I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. And I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. And I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield. service of the Lord. Lord, when I die, let me die in the service of the Lord. And when I die, let me die in the service of the Lord. And I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Don't you know, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. Oh, yeah, Lord, I'm a hard fighting soldier. On the battlefield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I yield, and I'll be bringing so to Jesus by the service that I What an incredible World Missions Jubilee we've had. I'm so excited tonight to be able to speak uh, to all the mighty men in the glorious kingdom of God. I do want to begin by uh, just thanking so much Rob Anakea uh, for all of the incredible work behind the scenes in the cyber ministry. I want to thank Brian Carr, our amazing director of the World Missions Jubilee. I want to thank Jason for that very generous and kind uh, introduction and uh, welcome. As well, I'd be remiss to not thank our, my dear friend, perhaps one of my best friends in all the movement of God, Dr. Tim Kernan. I want to thank the L.A. Shepherds, the Antalans, as well as the Kirshners. And I want to thank the mighty brothers of the Chicago International Christian Church. I'm representing the brothers of the Chicago Church tonight, and I'm very, very honored. Uh, but, and then finally, I want to uh, just take a minute and really acknowledge uh, my father in the faith, uh, my leader for the last over 35 years, uh, Brother Kip McKean. I want to thank Kip for giving me this opportunity as well to share with all the men in the kingdom tonight. You know, when I think about Kip, what comes to mind for me is an old ancient Chinese proverb. And it simply says that one generation plants the seeds and another generation enjoys the shade. And Kip, I want to thank you for the incredible seed that you planted in this generation for disciples of Jesus to be totally committed to Christ. Thank you for the shade that you provided for us through the five core convictions. Thank you for the shade that you provide for us uh, in central leadership and allowing us to have the unity because we're a, a ministry and we're a movement uh, that is governed by central leadership. Uh, we're so thankful for you, bro. We love you, and we're very, very grateful. Well, let's get down to business. Men, are you ready? I'm ready. 
You know, title of our lesson tonight is Dreams and Vision. You know, I hope tonight that I'm able to say something to you as men that will probably disrupt your spiritual lives a little bit. That, that will make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know, I find that when I feel uncomfortable, it leads me to come forth and turn myself into God and go deeper in my relationship with God. I hope tonight I'm able to say something that will inspire you to grow in your vision and perhaps even restore your vision in your relationship with God and restore your vision for all the things that God has for you to do. Before I start, let me be clear. You know, a lot of people are talking about COVID and a lot we, we think that, well, this is a COVID generation or this is a COVID era. I'm here to tell you tonight, this is not a COVID era. This is a dreams and vision era. You know, I'm so excited that as men of the kingdom of God, you are, we are together the guardians of the precious vision. We're the watchmen over the vision. We're the gatekeepers of the vision. We're the ones that are to, to take the vision forth, the sacred vision forth uh, in our relationship with God. But we do have an adversary, and that adversary is Satan himself. Satan wants to do everything imaginable to stop the vision of God from being fulfilled. It's his goal to destroy the vision to burn it down, to tear it down. You know, this became very acute in my own life. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was at my prayer spot praying. I was looking at the beautiful sunshine. The grass was blowing. It was green. The lake was pristine blue. It was unbelievable. And I thought, you know what? The only reason life is tending the way it is this morning is because God is holding back Satan. You know, I really believe if it were up to Satan, the sun would be dark. The sky would not be blue, but it would be black. The grass would, would be desert. It would be a wasteland because Satan wants to destroy. You know, I saw a commercial uh, during the Super Bowl a few years ago, and this commercial started out with just a black screen. And then there was a little circle that started opening slowly and slowly and slowly. And in the background, as the circle was opening, that was the most beautiful piano music that, that I had ever heard. It was incredible. And as the circle got wider and wider, you could start seeing the smoke in the background of the circle. You could the, the piano was still playing, and then it would open wider, and you could see the charred, burned walls, what, what appeared to be a house. And, and as it opened wider and not wider, and the piano music got louder and louder and more and more beautiful, you could see that the entire house had burned to the ground, and right in the middle of the house was a little boy playing the piano. While the house had burned and was charred and was smoking, it was in total ruin, but the piano music was sounding so beautiful, and then the caption came, and a couple of hands came on the screen, and it said, you're in good hands with Allstate. You know, and I'm here to tell you tonight that no matter what burning or charring Satan tries to do, no matter what Satan tries to do to destroy the vision of God, I want you to know tonight, brothers, you're in good hands. Not with all state, but you're in good hands with God. You know, no matter what's going on in our lives tonight, no matter how challenging it might be, I want you to understand that God in his vision for your life is always aligning things. Perhaps some of the, the challenges and the trials you go through are God, is God aligning things to fulfill his vision in your life. You know, tonight we're going to look at a man by the name of Nehemiah. Nehemiah understood what charred walls look like. He understood what it meant to have a dream that he had burned to the ground and to have to go to God and have that dream rebuilt. You know, God's vision for us is to build great dreams and to have great visions. Any men here tonight have or ever have a dream that just got burned to the ground? You know, something that you believed in, something that you thought, something that you were going for in your life and it just 
They just never seem to exactly work out in order for that dream to come true for you. Perhaps God frustrated you along the way. Perhaps God blocked that dream because, in fact, it was not actually the dream that he had for you. And in the end, for you, that dream became charred. You know, I've had that happen to me many times in my life where I've had to get to a point in my life where things that I thought I was going for, things that I thought were for me, visions that I thought were going to be the vision for my life, God ended up saying no and things didn't work out that way. But you know what I found is that, that that charred rock bottom when that happened became the solid foundation in my life that I needed to rebuild my spiritual vision with God. Let's go ahead and turn in the Holy Scriptures over to Acts chapter 2. I want to make a few points about a vision this morning, that this uh, tonight, that I think will really help us and really, really inspire us. Of course, our text is taken from Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2. And if you would read with me, starting in verse 14, the Bible says, Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as some of you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. What a powerful passage about vision. You know, vision in our lives is very, very important to God. In fact, the word vision is found over 200 times in the scriptures. And certainly for us as disciples, we're thankful for this vision passage because it ushered into the kingdom. It was the fulfillment of many, many generational promises that God had made. You know, a lot of times when we read this passage, we, we forget to understand that this is the birthplace of vision. The Bible here says that the vision comes from the Spirit of God. First you get the Spirit of God, then you get the vision of God. You know, the idea of being poured out here is the idea of a rain, a rain, rainy day. The idea of uh, of a waterfall or perhaps more graphically it, it would be like the Niagara Fall pouring out the Spirit of God on you of course in the Old Testament the Spirit would be only given out in drops and Moses in Numbers chapter 11 prayed that that this would cease that it would stop just being poured out in drops and be poured out like Joel talked about you know Moses long to see that day. You know, one of the mistakes we make as men is we forget how necessary the Spirit is in our daily lives. You know, God has an incredible expectation for us to dwell in the Spirit and to live in the Spirit and to remain in the Spirit until Jesus comes back. If you will, over in Matthew chapter 25, we find the story of the virgins. And in the story, we won't take time to read it tonight, uh, but what we find here in the story of the, of the versions in Matthew chapter 25 is that the Spirit of God throughout the Bible is symbolic by oil. And of course, over in Acts chapter 1, we see the, the, the Spirit represented in all of its four forms. In, in, in the, the, the thunder, the, the lightning, the fire, the oil. And, and here, tonight, we only have time to talk about the oil. It, it was poured out. The oil represents the spirit being poured out. And of course, here in Matthew chapter 25, we see that the oil is symbolic of the spirit here. Jesus is telling the story about the last days and how all of the people that are waiting and expecting Jesus to come back are to be prepared, are to be living and dwelling 
in the spirit. And yet in this story, we find that some are neglecting to have the spirit, neglecting to have the oil, while others are ready and filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the proper way to watch and be ready and be waiting for God? Well, we know what it's not, and that's in verse 7. It says, Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. You know, I pray tonight that as men, that our lives are full of oil. I pray tonight that, that, that we can embrace the vision of God and, and that we can be filled with the oil of the Spirit so that our lamps are not going out. You know, today we are living the vision of Joel. We've been living that vision since the day of Pentecost. Peter said, this day is now. It's right now. This is not a COVID era. This is a spirit and vision era. You know, it's interesting about the spirit. The Bible says we should be dripping in it. It should be like Niagara Falls in our lives. We, we should be wearing the oil. You know, probably the best example I can think of is, is brothers not wearing lotion. You know, you can tell when a man doesn't have lotion if you go up and, 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 and you take your fingernail and you scratch across his arm, you'll see a streak there because he's cracking. He's ashy. He doesn't have any oil. He doesn't have any lotion. He doesn't have any oil. You know, it's an interesting passage in Song of Songs about sisters being attracted to men that have the oil of perfume on them. Some of you brothers may not be dating tonight because you're not filled with the oil. Look over and see that in Solomon, uh, Song of Solomon's chapter 1 and verse 3. I, I encourage sisters, don't date a brother that's not soaked in oil, sisters. You know, someone once said that vision is hope with a blueprint. People ask me all the time, John, what is the vision of God? What, what, what is God's vision for our life? What is God's vision for my life? You know, it's interesting. I've come to, to believe and understand uh, over years of uh, walking with the Lord that, that the vision of God is simply that we have God's vision. You say, well, that's really, really simple. Well, it's true. God's vision is that you have and live God's vision. And this means that we've got to believe what God's vision is. Well, what, what does that mean? Look over in Genesis, because the, the vision of God is, is only one vision. It's the vision that God has always had for us. It's the vision that he had for us in the beginning. It's the vision that he's had for us in the middle. It's the vision that he will have for us in the end. And it's found here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish uh, uh, in the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, we see the vision of, of God. God's vision from the very beginning is that we would be the splitting image of him. That's God's vision for you as a man. Everything that God does in your life, all the things that God takes you through, all the discipling that you get, all the sermons that you hear are all God's vision for you to fulfill his vision which is to be like him. You know, this is a picture of the future. This is a vision that God has for men. He says, he blesses him, which is a prayer. And then he says, go out and multiply. Go out and, and, and fill the earth. His first words to men are to go out 
and fill the earth with this vision. This was day six of creation, but this was day one to man. I mean, imagine God with his first son. Imagine how he must have felt watching Adam and seeing Adam all alone and having this incredible vision and giving Adam this vision that by himself was impossible for him. Go out and subdue and fill the earth with more men and women. I don't know about you, but if, if I were Adam, I probably would have been very overwhelmed with that vision. Well, how am I as one man going to go and fill the earth. God put Adam to sleep and, and he took a bone from Adam. And in that bone was God's answer to the vision. You know, a lot of times we think we need a lot to fulfill the vision of God. What if you had a vision that you had the you had to subdue and replicate yourself throughout the earth. By the way, that's the vision and that's the dream for every disciple, to replicate disciples throughout the earth. That is our mission, to baptize, to seek and save the lost, to see disciples in this generation have an that they have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And of course here, God says my answer to this vision is a bone. A lot of times we think we need so much to be fruitful, to be effective, to multiply, to fulfill the vision. And yet God said the vision for eternity will be fulfilled with a bone. Why is that so powerful? Well, look over at Psalms 33. Psalms 33. To me, this is the secret weapon to vision, to our lives as men in the kingdom of God. This is our secret weapon. This is the weapon of weapons that should make us strong, that should make us believe that any vision God gives us, we can fulfill. Here in Psalms 33 and verse 12, the Bible says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. There it is right there. What's the answer to God fulfilling his vision in us? What's the secret weapon? We're God's people. We're God's nation. We are the people that God has chosen to give the inheritance to. I don't know about you, but that fires me up. That, that, that God has chosen us to be his nation. As the nation of God, as the people of God, there's no vision that God can't fulfill through us. I hope you're saying amen out there, brothers. And then over in Proverbs chapter 29, let me share a couple more things about vision, and then I'm going to get into two of my points. Here in uh, Proverbs chapter 29, because a lot of times, you know, we, we read this particular passage about vision, and we simply apply it uh, to the loss. We, we, we preach this uh, passage from a perspective of evangelism, but it's much more than that. But we find it here in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. Where there's no vision, people cast off restraint or people perish. This is the necessity of vision. You know, we, we preach this passage and we say, well, if you don't get a vision for the loss, then the loss will perish. That, that's, a, that's a good application, but it's not the only or even the primary application of this passage. This passage is about we, men of God, having vision or we will perish. It doesn't simply mean to die or, 
or uh, perish in hell. That's a totally different word. The word here is para. And this word has three meanings. It means to be stripped naked, zero, barren, or to perhaps even reverse and go backwards. That if you don't have vision, you'll reverse and you'll go backwards and amount to nothing. As men do not, we've got to have spiritual vision. We've got to have spiritual dreams. We've got to have spiritual goals. What's a picture of Proverbs 29, 18 look like? Well, if you had a plaque, if there was a plaque right behind me right here, and it said this verse where there is no vision, the people perish, and the plaque was right here, and it just so happened that as it relates to me and my plaque, the devil you fell off. And I was still standing here with no vision. The plaque would then read, here, there is no vision. And for many of us, that's our lives. The W has fallen off. And because of circumstances, be, 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 because of not uh, having our quiet times, because of not giving our hearts to God the way he wants us to, because of not surrendering our will to God, the plaque now reads, here, there is no vision. Maybe that's true in our churches. We look at all the problems in our churches, and the W has fallen off, and it says, here, there is no vision. Well, let's look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an incredible servant of God, perhaps the greatest example of how God's vision works in the Bible. In Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Halakiah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The walls of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And let's just stop right there. You know, I mentioned earlier that, that Nehemiah is such an example of the vision of God. And how in the midst of difficulty and, and, and charged circumstances and broken walls in our life, that God can burst through the rubble and bring a new vision into our lives. And of course here, Nehemiah has this dream in his head. He has this dream in his heart of how wonderful things are in Jerusalem. After all, Nehemiah had been enslaved his entire life. He was born into slavery from the time the Jews were taken into captivity, uh, cap captivity with the destruction of the temple in 586 BC. It had now been 142 years since this date. 14 years since Ezra led a group of people back in order to go and build the wall. The destruction of the wall, the condition of the wall was of great sorrow. It was the destruction of a great dream for the people of God. In fact, look over at Psalms chapter 137 because Psalms 137 gives us an insight as it, it actually reflects on the mindset and the heart and how the people felt by having the dream of the temple destroyed. Here in Psalms 137, in verse 1 through 6, the Bible says, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and we wept. When we remembered Zion, there on the poplars, we hung our hearts, for there our captives asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord 
while we are in a foreign land. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the root of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy, I wonder tonight if this is how we feel about the kingdom of God. I wonder if we feel like the captives felt. Like if there's anything more important than the kingdom of God in our life. If we have vision for anything more than the kingdom of God in our life, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue stick to the top of the roof of my mouth. If I forget God's vision for his glorious kingdom. Nehemiah said in chapter 1, I asked those who had escaped and survived the captivity concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah's body was in Persia, but his heart and his interest were in Jerusalem, some 800 miles away. He had heard the stories passed down to him from his in-laws, from his grandparents, from his parents, from fellow Jews. He had heard the stories about how great Jerusalem was in its day. How incredible the temple was. Now from time after time after time, God had delivered the people from the enemies. He thought in his mind how beautiful the temple must have been. Its walls, its strong, erect, incredible walls, how God had protected the people. No doubt in his mind, he dreamed as a slave, as one born into captivity, one day, I'm going to return to Jerusalem. One day I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to that great city. And I'm going to see it for myself. I'm going to see the splendor. I'm going to enjoy the spiritual festivals. I'm going to see the most holy of holies. One day I'm going to celebrate the Lord in that city. He must have thought, how much better will life be when I can leave Susa and go home to the nations of God? Have you ever dreamed that only if you were not where you are, things would be better? Have you ever dreamed that your life could be so much better if things were different? Perhaps if you lived in L.A. or you lived in Miami where Matt and Helen are. Or if you lived in, in New York or San Francisco or Seattle. Maybe you're a Paris brother. Maybe, maybe you, you would do better if you were in Paris. Maybe you would thrive in London if you were in London. With the double-decker buses, you would do better spiritually riding on the top of that bus. You ever wondered how you would do if things were different? You can imagine Nehemiah hearing that Henani and some of the others had been to Jerusalem and seen it and came back. Nehemiah would have searched all over town for his brother Hananiah. He would have wanted to hear all of the stories. He would ask, has anybody seen Hananiah and the brothers that are back? I can imagine him calling, Hananiah, Hananiah! Or perhaps he would use the Hebrew interpretation, interpretation of his name, God is glorious, where is God is glorious? Come over and tell me, tell me everything about Jerusalem. Tell me how the 50,000 that had gone back with the vision had changed things. How does the city look? What's going on in the temple? He's eager to know everything. He wants to know if it's exactly as it was in his dream. And you can imagine the smile fading away 
when Hannity says, my dear brother, please sit down. I'm going to tell you, but, but you've got to sit down. Nehemiah is nothing like you dreamed it was. It's nothing like you believed in your heart it would be. The walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The gates have been burned to the ground with fire. The city is in ruin. You know, in ancient times, cities had walls. And the wall was an important defense that surrounded the city. It was these walls that were strong and high, several meters thick, that kept the city safe, that made the city a city. They would have large flat uh, uh, tops on the walls where, where soldiers would walk around the walls. The guardians would walk around and, and watch out for captors and watch out for the enemy. These walls meant everything. These gates meant everything. Nehemiah chapter 3, they had name. There was the sheep gate that represented the Lamb of God. There was the fish gate that represented the followers of God. There was the old gate that represented the OGs in the kingdom of God, the old godlies like me and Kip and others who, whose walls may not be as strong as they used to be, but the walls are still standing. They represented the dumb gate where the gate where all the garbage was taken out of the temple. The valley gate where the humility and the valley of decision occurred. They represented the fountain gate, which represented life. The water gate, which represented the word. The east gate, that represented hope and the rising of the sun. The horse gate, that represented wrestling with God. The master gate, that represented self-evaluation. These gates, these walls, meant something. And they were destroyed. You know, you say, well, what does this have to do with me? Every brother here tonight needs to keep his walls in great condition around the city of his soul. Perhaps at one time your relationship with God was great. You, you had a vision that you were going to change the world. And somehow that, that vision has diminished. Sin has gotten in and, and, and started to uh, make your walls crack and break down spiritually. Maybe sin has gotten in your life and has now affected your walls. You know, spirituality has begun to fall into despair. Your, the, the, the dream that you had to be the disciple that you thought you would be, you're, you're not living the way God wanted you to live. The walls around your city of your soul have been compromised. I want to challenge us tonight as men, we've got to get our walls together. God needs someone. God needs believers of his vision to change the world. You know, we've got five months left in this year. No matter what condition your walls are in right now, you can turn it around. You can fix those walls in the next five months and have the greatest spiritual year of your life. But you've got to believe the vision of God. What's God's vision? That you believe his vision for an evangelized world in this generation. That you believe his vision that you can be the splitting image of God in heart, in character, in focus, in dedication, in generosity, in forgiveness. Let's make sure we believe the vision of God. And then number two, you've got to see the vision to be the vision. Let's go back over to Nehemiah in chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 5. The Bible says, Then I said, speaking of Nehemiah, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying. 
before you day and night for your servant, the people of Israel. I confess the sins of the Israelites, including myself and my father's family, that they have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you have given your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from where they are and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Number one, you've got to believe God's vision. Number two, you've got to see the vision and you've got to be the vision. Nehemiah says here that, that I was a cupbearer to the king. He had this incredible vision and this dream of what Jerusalem would be like, as we saw earlier. And yet, and the knee shatters Nehemiah's dream. You know, sometimes God makes you lose the dream in order for you to see the vision. You know, as cupbearer and as one who was born into captivity, living under the rule of King Xerxes, Nehemiah had a very, very comfortable life. And, and what a job the cupbearer to the king. This spoke volumes of the character of Nehemiah. Nehemiah lived with a constant threat on his life. Assassination was a constant fear. Artaxerxes' father himself was assassinated by a royal aide in his chamber. And Nehemiah would have to sip the wine to make sure it was okay. And yet here we find, and as we looked at earlier in verse 1, Nehemiah remembers exactly where he was when Hanani told him the story. When he said, sit down. You ever got news that made you just have to sit down? You know, 2020 has been that kind of year. There's been a lot of news in 2020 that you just have to sit down to hear. I'll never forget when I got a text from my daughter. It was on a Sunday morning. I was just about to go up and preach a sermon. And I got a text from my daughter that Kobe Bryant and his teenage daughter had died in a hel helicopter crash. I remember just shaking my head thinking we never got to reach out to Kobe and I just needed to sit down. Also, just this last year, I got a call from, from my sister. My son was just murdered. He, he was a barber. He was someone that, that I, I helped raise and mentor. And there was a guy in his barber shop swearing and cursing. And he said, hey, you can't curse in here like that. This is a Christian establishment. The guy jumped out of the chair, ran out of the barber store, jumped in his car, drove around the corner, came back about 15 minutes later, and my nephew was standing out front of his barber shop and he opened fire, shooting over 30 bullets into my nephew's body. I had to sit down when I heard that news. You know, maybe someone that is in our ministry that hasn't been doing well spiritually. Maybe it's a fall away that's made you have to sit down. Maybe a loved one in your life has passed away this year. So many have lost loved ones to COVID-19. America is sitting down 
hearing the news. You know, this isn't just a picture of a wall, but this is a picture of the condition of people in our world. What is the burnt stone? The burnt stones, as 1 Peter chapter 2 says, are the living stones, which are you and I. We are the stones of this wall. We're the stones, Ephesians chapter 2, that are being built together to form the house, the building of God. Many are heartbroken by grief and disappointment, injustice. Many of us had to sit down as we watched the video of George Floyd, as we were reminded of the racial injustice and prejudice in this country. Many had to sit down to hear the news. You know, as disciples, we can think things can't change. Maybe you've been hurt in, in, in a discipling relationship. Maybe sin has gotten in your life and maybe there's been perpetual sin that's going on in your life and you may be thinking, hey, I can't change. God's never going to use me. I can never trust. I can never love. I've been hurt so bad before. I can never love again. I can never dream again. Well, I'm here to tell you that our God walks through the rubble, walks through the charred and burned walls so that you can live again. You know, Nehemiah had to lose the dream in order to see the vision. For many of us tonight as men as well, we're, we're so busy living our dream. We've lost sight of God's vision for our lives. We can end up like the people of like the Jews who went back to Jerusalem. They were back for 142 years. The exiles went back and, and they did nothing. They sat there, they got comfortable and they looked at the wall day after day after day and they accepted things the way they are. We can do the same thing in our Bible talks. When visitors are coming, when we're not inviting people to church. We can do the same thing now while we're in COVID. We, we can't reach out to people. We can't study with people. And, and, and we can look at the charred walls and just sit there and do nothing. We sit back in church. We cooperate. But we never fully give ourselves to the ministry. We're just hoping that we can get to heaven. Muhammad Ali says a person who thinks the same way 20 years as he did at the person who thinks the same way at 20 at, at 40 as he did at 20 wasted 20 years of his life. I hope we don't think the same way at 25 as we did at 20. At 40 as we did at, at, at 30. As 40 as we did at 50 thereby wasting years of our lives. Number two, we can do like Hanani. We can go and, and, and we, we can see the walls and we can turn around and we can go back to our captors. We can go back to where we were before, back to our old lives, back to our old patterns and let the vision die. You know, it's interesting because sadly, there's no evidence in Scripture that even after the wall was rebuilt, that Hanani and the others had a part in the rebuild. You know, I'm so excited about how God is rebuilding his movement in this generation. I'll never forget in 2003, I was one of the first persons Kip asked to move to Portland and to join the new movement. I didn't have the faith at that time to make that decision. I even went to the first two World Mission Jubilees in Portland. But I didn't have the faith, and I went back. And I'm so thankful that in 2017, God gave me faith to come and help rebuild the walls in his kingdom. Number three, we can be like Nehemiah. We can keep the dream alive. We can let go of our dream in order to live God's vision 
The Bible says Nehemiah sat down and he wept for some days. He mourned and he fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. You know, one of the first things you've got to do in order to embrace the vision of God is you've got to weep before you can seek. He said, when I heard those words, I wept and I mourned. Are we mourning over the state of the world today? You know, the book of Lamentations is a collection of poetic reflections on lamenting over what happened to Jerusalem. To lament is a biblical response. To, 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 to cry over the condition of the world, to cry over the condition of your soul, to weep over the condition of your Bible talk, over the condition of your home, over the condition of your family as men is a biblical response to charred walls. You know, very often we lack this emotion over the plight of the lost, over the plight of our home, of our children. We, we lack this emotion to lament. This was not true of Jesus. Matthew 23, the Bible says, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you. Hebrews chapter five, verse seven, the Bible says, Jesus with loud cries and tears prayed for people. Jesus was not lacking this emotion. Now, don't give me that, well, I'm a man, I don't cry stuff. That just means you'd rather be joyful than rather be mournful. mournful. It means you'd rather, you, you'd rather feast than, than fast. As a crier, this can lead you to become a crusader. He says, then I pray. You know, you got to pray to find your way. You got to weep before you seek, but then you got to pray to find your way. We can read about several of Nehemiah's prayers throughout the book of Nehemiah. In 13 chapters, there's 11 prophetic prayers from Nehemiah. Nehemiah also knew his spiritual history. We see in verse 8 and 9, he, he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse, 60, verse uh, 62 and 67. He says, that, that, that God said, if you don't obey, he'll scatter you, but that if you obey, he'll gather you. That scripture is still true to this day. I find in my life when, when I, I, I'm not seeking the vision of God and I'm not striving to do what God wants me to do, everything scatters in my life. Go ahead and say amen if that's true for you too. I know I'm not the only one. When you start trying to do it your way, things scatter. But then when you get humble and you go to God and you trust God, then God gathers. We've got to learn how to pray and fast, brothers. We've got to learn how to lament. We've got to learn how to feel the way Jesus felt. What makes you hungry in your spiritual life? I can tell you one thing that will make you hungry. Fasting. Fasting will make you hungry real fast. David said, I was hungry for God. I was thirsty for God. You know, one of the unique qualities that God responds to is hunger. We see that in the Canaanite woman. She said, just give me some crumbs. And Jesus responded to her hunger. We see that with the feeding of the 5,000. The disciples didn't have that heart. They said, send the people away. Jesus said, no, I respond to hunger. You give them something to eat. We see it with the 4,000. We see it in the parting words of Jesus in John 21. He says, Peter, feed my sheep. Jesus responds to hunger. I respond to hunger. You know, when I was living in L.A., I, I don't know what it was about me, but the homeless people just knew John Causey responds to hunger. And there'd be people that would be dressed real nice, look real nice, all sorts of things, and they'd walk right by those people and walk up to me and ask me for stuff. It's like every homeless person in L.A. was asking me, and I'm like, what is it about me? But I respond to hunger. Rarely will I not help somebody that's hungry. 
You know what else I respond to? I respond to tears. Nobody knows that better than my wife. I even respond to fake tears. Tears move my heart. Tears move God's heart. You know, over the last month, we've prayed so much in Chicago. I made it my goal during the month of July to pray more than I slept. And towards the end of the month, I was sitting down having my morning devotional time with Emma, and she says, you know what? You actually pray more than you sleep right now. I remember telling brothers, and brothers would look at me like, what? You pray? You pray more than you sleep? Now, I can't keep it up forever. But, but for a month in my life, I prayed more than I slept. During that month, we had more campus students baptized in our church than any other month. We grew by more disciples in that month than any other month. We actually crossed 100 uh, additions in the Chicago church, starting with 131. By the grace of God, I believe the Chicago church will double this year. Why? Because we're lamenting, we're weeping, we're crying over the walls around this city. We're striving to fulfill the vision of God that every man in Chicago will be the splitting image of God. When you fill the earth with disciples, you fill heaven with disciples as well. And that's our goal. You know, you might say, well, bro, that, that sounds good, but I'm, I'm just afraid to try again. You, you want me to, to have vision again for God? Yes, I want you to have vision again. Fear is putting your circumstances between you and God. Vision is putting God between you and your circumstances. And so you've got to weep before you seek. You've got to pray to find your way. You've got to dare to share. You know, there's a call to action in every vision. You're not just called to be saved. You're also called to be a saver. Nehemiah had to share God's vision with the king. He was just a cupbearer. But he had to share God's vision with the king. Some of us are afraid to share God's vision with a co-worker. We're afraid to share God's vision with family, with our neighbor, with the guy standing in the, 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 the drugstore line. Nehemiah had to share God's vision with the king. You know, it's it's interesting because you had to be invited into a king's presence to even address the king. If you weren't invited and the king didn't put out his scepter, you would be killed. But not only that, if you were sad in the king's presence, it was punishable by death. Nehemiah, in his job as cupbearer, had never been sad in the king's presence before. That blows me away. Because every time I lifted that cup to make sure it wasn't poisonous, I would have been sad. I wouldn't have been fired up about that. Oh, I'm going to drink. I'm going to drink the cup that's going to kill me. Nehemiah would, 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 would taste the king's wine and be happy. And the Bible says he had never been sad in the king's presence before. Some of us are sad for a whole lot less. You know, we're, we're, we're sad if 10 cents is missing from our check. We're sad if the sister we like doesn't want to date us. We're sad if we share our faith with somebody and, and they can't study for two weeks. We're sad for so much less. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. 
His life was on the line every time he took a drink for the king. Imagine doing that job and being happy every day. You got a dare to share. Nehemiah took that dare. He put his life on the line. He went into the king's presence. And by the way, every day as disciples, our lives are on the line. Your cupbearer is your discipler, protecting you, watching over you, fighting with you. Nehemiah took that challenge and he shared, he dared to share with the king. You know, I want to give us a challenge as we close out. God's vision is that we live God's vision. Number one, we got to believe God's vision. Number two, we got to see God's vision. We got to be God's vision. We got to weep before we seek. We've got to pray for God to give us a way. And then we've got to dare to share. Nehemiah took that challenge. He gave up his dream for God's vision. And in 52 days, Nehemiah fulfilled the vision of God and rebuilt the wall and rebuilt the nation of God. 52 days. How different as men can the kingdom be if we just all devote ourselves like never before in the next 52 days? Can you take the 52 day challenge? 52 days from today is September 28th, 2020. We take the challenge to bring 52 people to church in the next 52 days. We take the challenge to pray and study your Bible a minimum of 52 minutes a day. We fast from something for the next 52 days to be fruitful in the next 52 days? What if every man of God fasted for 52 days to be fruitful in the next 52 days? You know, what's so ironic is September 28th, which is 52 days from tonight, is actually Yom Kippur. It's the most holiest day in the Jewish calendar. It's the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. I don't think it's a coincidence that God has given us this 52 day challenge to end on Yom Kippur. At the end of Yom Kippur, believers of the Jewish faith would break their fast on that day. The signaling of the breaking of the fast would be the Shafur would be pulled out by one of the shepherds. And the shepherd would then blow the Shafur. I'm not going to blow it right now. But I'm going to put up a post on Zoom on September 28th. After 52 days, while well, during those 52 days, I'm going to learn how to blow the Shafur, signaling the end of your fast. I challenge every man in the movement of God to lament, to fast, to pray, to be fruitful in the next 52 days. Are you up for the vision? Are you up for the challenge? I'll see you on Zoom in 52 days to blow the Shafur. In closing tonight, a young man in London wanted with everything in his soul and being to be a writer. But everything was stacked against him. 
The walls around his life were charred, burned to the ground, offering little hope for his dream to come true. He had four years of school only. His father was put in jail because he was a vagabond and would not pay his debts. Just to survive, he took a job putting stickers on bottles at a warehouse. At night, he would live in the warehouse with a couple of other homeless young boys in a rat-infested warehouse. He slept in the attic there. And then finally, he got up the nerve to mail out a manuscript. The reply came back, total rejection. He mailed out another, and another, and another, and another, and they were all rejected. Finally, he decided he would mail out one final manuscript in hopes that it would be accepted. Well, to his surprise, it was accept accepted, but without pay. The editor simply said, in a note, great manuscript, you did a great job. The young man took that note, clenched in his hand, ran out into the city streets, crying his eyes out because someone had acknowledged that he had done something that was good. This led him to continue writing. And because of that one note, we've been blessed to have the great author Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens wrote these words, which I think so appropriately define this era of dreams and vision. This era of COVID-19, this era of injustice, this era of destruction, this era of circumstance, and yet this era of opportunity. Charles Dickens said it was the best of times it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of, of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. It was a winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. This was the tale of two cities. Which city will we choose tonight? Which city will we choose for ourselves? Which city will we choose for all of the nations of the world? I pray that we will embrace the vision of God. I pray that we will believe the vision of God that we will see the vision of God, that we will be the vision of God, and that we will go in the direction of the vision of God to heaven and to God be all the glory. See you September 28th, brothers. Greetings from New Delhi, India. The topic I'm supposed to speak today is Bible talk leading. And I believe that every single disciple should aspire to become a Bible talk leader. Please be turning your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God says over here that he wants all men to be saved. And I believe that, that when we start doing that, when we have the very words of God in our mind, in our hearts, is when we will start making an impact in people's lives. I was reading somewhere, and it said that an average person 
whether he likes it or not, gets to influence 10,000 people in his lifetime. That's an average guy. 10,000 people. Now, influence them in the bad or influence them towards the good, that's a different deal. But 10,000 people, just an average person. Now, I believe that as disciples, we have God with us, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and we should have a fire to go, I do more and influence people and help them to know the truth about God and God's word. We need to have the very dream of God if we are planning to help each and every single person on planet Earth. Our three practical points today. Number one, in order to be an excellent Bible talk leader, you've got, you got to understand that saving begins by praying. Saving begins by praying. Let me show you what, what I mean. Go look up our saying, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Take a look what it says. It says, I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanks even be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. All right. He says over here that, that first of all, petition, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. The way I read it, it simply means, first of all, that prayers, 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 and prayers be made for all people. I don't see much of a difference in what Paul is saying over there. What he means is we've got to begin with God. We need God to be able to go and make an impact in this world. If you have to work your entire life, you work at one thing. You work in improving your prayers. You work to make sure you have an awesome bond with God. Only when we change can we help another person to change. That's number one. Number two, I believe let the Bible do the talking. Why do I say that? I know many times we want to, you know, talk about this and talk about that and this person, that person, how great this is, how great that is and all these things. I think a Bible talk simply means let the Bible do the talking. So in other words, bring the person back to the word of God. Bring the person back. Remind him that it's the word of God that makes a difference in his life. Point number three is make a goal or stay in the hole. Make a goal or stay in the hole. What do I mean? There's no way you can say I'm leading a Bible talk and not have a goal. Start with a goal. Oh, my Bible talk is very bad. That's okay. Begin with something. I'll baptize one person in six months. That's good. But have a goal. And once you, once you attain that, you go, okay, one person now in four months, one person now in two months, one in one month. And you keep going that way. You've got to have a goal. Without a goal, you will stay in the hole. And you, want, you, you don't want to do that. So, coming back to it. Like I said, I believe that God has called each and every disciple to be awesome Bible talk leaders. May you begin today. Thank you so much. May God bless you. Shepherding. For those serving as shepherds, we want to really thank you for your service. Uh, shepherding is a very important role in our church. And as our churches grow, there's a need for more shepherds. I want to talk about three different things in my short snippet here. And the first one I want to talk about is embracing your role and taking ownership of your sheep. You know, it's easy to be given a role, but not really embrace it. If you're a shepherd, then you probably have other roles in the church. But I want to talk to you about your role as a shepherd. Let's look at John 10, verse 11 through 13. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. You know, we know that Jesus is the ultimate shepherd. And from this scripture, we see 
that a shepherd loves and cares for his sheep. The hired hand, on the other hand, abandons and runs because he cares nothing for the sheep. You know, if you're a shepherd or a shepherd in training, it all starts with a decision. And that decision is to take ownership of the flock, to be responsible for the church that Jesus gave up his blood for. If you own it, you'll defend it. If you don't own it, you won't care for it in at the same time. The second part I want to talk about is your responsibilities. Know your responsibilities so you can stay focused. Your responsibility is not to protect the disciples from the evangelist and women's ministry leader. Your responsibility is laid out clearly in Acts 20, verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28 says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherd of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Keep watch. Be on guard over yourselves. Your first responsibility is for you and your partner. It's to do great spiritually. If you're not doing great spiritually, you really cannot help others to do great spiritually. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 says, If you can't manage your own household, how can you take care of God's church? So you have to really take care of yourself first. The second part of keeping watch over the flock is your, your next responsibility, and that's to the women's ministry leader and the evangelist of the church because they are the spiritual ceiling of the church and Satan's primary target. So they need to be doing great spiritually as well. The third is the rest of the church. There are four things to keep watch over the flock. Unresolved conflicts and forgiveness, inconsistent discipling, lack of fellowship and, and isolation, unfruitful and unproductive disciples. The third thing I want to talk about is care for your sheep. Anyone can own something, but will they take care of what they own? You know, think about it. When you bought your kid a toy, then five minutes later, it's on the floor. Do they really care about that toy? To take care of the sheep, you have to know them, know their tendencies, know how they're doing, whether they're hurting or they're weak or just anything that can actually distract them from their relationship with God. John 21, verse 15 to 17 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, Peter compromised in his relationship with Jesus after denying him three times. Jesus asked Peter if he loved him three times to help Peter, number one, stay focused on what he needed to do. Secondly, he had to reaffirm his love and loyalty to Jesus after denying him three times. Peter was given the task to tend the flock to really take care of the sheep and to bring them home to heaven with him. Let's take care of God's house and God's people in shepherding and to God be all the glory. Amen. Greetings family on behalf of Metro Manila and the churches of Southeast Asia. Today I've been given the honor to talk about the full-time ministry. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 12. The full-time ministry is an honor for those that have been called by God to serve in such a way. And yet I want to put before you that the full-time ministry is not for everyone, but the ministry is for everyone that is a disciple of Jesus Christ. To be a minister simply means to be a servant. Every one of us needs to be a servant, but some of us have been called to serve full time. In Romans chapter 12, we pick up the scripture in verse 3. The Bible says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. So we have different varying abilities. He goes on to say in verse 4, Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. See, the body is, 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 is vast, and we all have different abilities, but we belong to one another. We must all be servants. 
But he goes on in verse 6 to say, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion with his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. This is a very misunderstood scripture. Oftentimes people have looked at this and, and seen these gifts as exclusive. These are not exclusive. These are inclusive gifts. Every one of us needs to embody every single one of these gifts. But what Paul is saying is that we have them in varying to degrees. He says for some people it's just evident. We all need to give. But man, that brother right there, he just gives and gives and gives. We all need to be encouraging. But that brother, man, he just pours himself out. The reason is because of verse 6. Paul says we all have different gifts according to the grace given us. The word grace in the Greek is cherries. The word gift that he uses here is rooted in the word cherries. It's where we get the word charisma. What Paul is saying is that God has given all of us cherries. He's given all of us grace. But that grace will bring out of us a charisma. And though we all need to display these qualities, it becomes evident when you are close to God that God has given you an additional ability in specific areas that are to be used. When it comes to the full-time ministry, to be a leader, to be an evangelist or a women's ministry leader, or even to be a full-time shepherd, this is something that is God has given you to use you for. What does it take to be in the full-time ministry? Number one, heart. Requires heart. Number two, talent. Both are essential. Heart is so important. Why? Because heart is about being a disciple. Talent is about gifts that God has given you. In Exodus chapter 18, for leadership, God tells Moses to select capable men. What was the qualification of a capable man? Number one, they must fear the Lord. That's an issue of the heart. Number two, they must be trustworthy. That's an issue of the heart. And number three, they must hate dishonest gain. That's an issue of the heart. It all starts with the heart. Why? Because it is your heart that's going to determine your hard work, your willingness to endure and persevere through trials and challenges and not give up when you feel bad for yourself. But number two is absolutely talent. You see, heart without talent will lead to disappointment. At the end of Exodus 18, the Bible says that once you've found young men who have great hearts, then talent comes in. Some will be able to lead over tens, fifties, hundreds, and even thousands. There are varying degrees of talent to be able to lead. Both are essential. But talent without heart will just create a Pharisee. Where's your heart at? Do, is your heart in the grace of God that you're doing great spiritually and you just want to glorify God regardless of your own glory and how you feel? But another important question that Paul talks about is you have to have a sober judgment of yourself. Each and every one of us has been called by God to serve in varying degrees. Today, I want to encourage and challenge each and every one of us to absolutely serve, to serve with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But for those that believe they've been given the talent for ministry, today I want to inspire and charge you that to build God's kingdom, we need young men and young women who have been given a God-given talent that have the right heart to build God's kingdom so that in this generation, we can evangelize the nations. And to God be all the glory. Brothers, let's be honest. How many times after a kingdom date, we were 100% sure that that sister was the one for you? Because the date was simply awesome. It was her favorite restaurant. You paid for her. And you even planned the second date. But a week later, a discipler comes to you and tells you to stop talking to that sister because you're not guarding her heart anymore. That is so terrible, isn't it? But why this happens? This happens because we misunderstand a very important concept on relationships. They're not based on 
intensity, they're based on consistency. Let's talk about this. And the title of my lesson today is Finding a Spouse. My name is Vini Rodriguez. I'm an evangelist here in the Sao Paulo International Christian Church, and I have the privilege to talk to you. I also have the privilege to be married to an incredible woman of God. Her name is Bia Rodriguez. So let's jump in the Bible in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 1 and 2. The Bible reads, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehonadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. Look at this. There was a king in Jerusalem named Amaziah. The Bible says that he did everything that was right. Everything that was right in the eyes of the Lord. But not wholeheartedly. Was he a good king? Was he a bad king? Should we imitate him? I don't know. Probably not. Even that he did everything that was right in the eyes of the Lord. What I know is that many of us can be just like Amaziah. We know the right answers. We know the right questions to do. We know what to do, but we simply don't do it. At least we don't do it with all our hearts. And this is, this is the reason why many of us are single now. Because we do want to get married one day, but we simply don't give our hearts. Maybe it's because we are fearful or insecure. But brothers, we need to give our hearts in this area. But it's very interesting because when, sometimes when we decide to give our hearts, it can be even worse. In Proverbs 25, verse 16, the Bible reads, If you find honey, eat just enough. Too much of it. And you vomit. We wait to give our hearts until we find the one. And when, when we decide to give our hearts, it's terrible. Because we give too much of it. In, in, in a way that is not wise. In a way that is not spiritual. That we're not helping the sister get closer to God. We are not, we are not being a good friend. We just have second intentions. The, the, the intention to get something back. This happened to me. I dated Bia, my wife, three times. One in the world, and it was terrible. But then we, we studied the Bible and got baptized. But we dated one time in the kingdom, and it was not good too. We weren't impure physically, but I would say we were impure emotionally. There were impurity. In Galatians 5 can also be translated as second intentions. When you give your heart to someone, do you have a second intention in it? Because this is not what God wants. And this is why we are so intense. And it is not about intensity. It is about consistency. Think about it. If you go to the gym and work out 24 hours in one day, you get nothing. But if you go to the gym and work one hour for 24 days, you get something. You know it. And relationships works in this very same way. It is not about doing crazy stuff. It is not like about buying sp expensive gifts. It's not about going to expensive places. It is not about talking to the sister the whole day long. It is about being consistent in your relationship with God. And it is about being consistent, being a good friend, and help the sister spiritually. I have a challenge for you. I have a practical here. If you're not giving your heart at all right now, just learn how to give your heart first. You can invite someone that you, you don't have expectations to date with or to get married with. For me, it helped me to invite older, single, spiritual sisters on dates. And I just learned so much from them. So much. I just learned how to give my heart. That's it. And this is my practical for you. But if you're dating, or if you are, 
if you have an in interest already in the Kindle, learn this. Not to give too much, because the sister just we want to flee from you or, or to vomit, as the scripture says. Learn how to be the, the first one to say goodbye and the last one to say hi. Guard her heart and God will bless you. And to God be all the glory. Hello everyone, the title of this sermon is Converting Family. And this is actually a topic that I really like, I enjoy talking about it, because I had the opportunity to personally experience something in my spiritual life, and I would like to share with you guys in the end of this sermon. So first of all, I would like to say that this is a theme that it's very important for every disciple of Jesus Christ. All of us, we dream to do great things, to evangelize the world, to save many people, to do crazy things for Jesus that maybe nobody else did before. But also we have this dream, each one of us, to save our family, to be sure that one day we'll be in heaven with God, but also with those we love here on earth. Those God gave to us with a purpose. So at this moment, I would like to read a scripture with you guys that maybe can help you and a lot to learn how to convert your family, how to be able to show them the love of Jesus and how it's amazing what we found, in other words, the kingdom of God. Let's open with me a scripture here in Luke chapter 4, verse 20. So, first of all, giving the context of this scripture, here for the first time in the history of mankind, Jesus, he came to the synagogue and he himself read in the Old Testament a story, a prophecy about him. Can you imagine this? You are reading a prophecy for many people about yourself. Something that, was, that has been written a long time ago about you. And he was fulfilling this prophecy that day. It was amazing. It was fantastic. And of course, the expectations of something so great is that people would appreciate it and would understand how great was this moment. And the one that was talking to them. In other words, Jesus Christ. But actually, they didn't have this reaction. And let's understand why. Let's read here. Luke chapter 4, verse 20. The Bible says, Then he rolled up the scroll, Jesus, because he finished to read, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do hear in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. So basically, it was not exactly as Jesus was expecting. Of course, many people appreciated. Many people understood this is the one. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But many other people, they were saying, wait, 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 I, I know him. He's just the son of Joseph's son. He grew up here. He's a normal person. He's not the Messiah. Some people didn't believe. And I think talking about our family, it's all about this. Your family are those that maybe, those who, knew, who know you best. They saw you growing up. They saw all your mistakes. They saw sometimes your worst sins. So, so they see you. It's hard for them to look at you and believe, ah, this person changed. It's hard because, because they know what many other people don't know about you. So that's why it's hard. And that's why sometimes we feel this insecurity in sharing our faith with our family and fighting for them and believing that, yes, if we could change, anybody can change, even people in our family. But Jesus understood this lesson. Jesus persevered for three years. And in the beginning, even his family thought he was crazy. But after persevering so much, he saved his family. So my personal story is about my mother. So I, I became a disciple almost six years ago. And I remember in the beginning, it was hard with my dad, with my mom, a lot of persecution. My mom always asked me, Luca, why do you wake up so early on Sunday service, on, on Sunday to go to Sunday service? Because I lived very far from the Sunday service place. 
And she never understood. She said, Luca, go to a church here, close to, to our house with me, with your family. Why, why you go to another church? And it was hard for her to understand, to appreciate the prophecy, to appreciate the, the word of God and understand that we, we need to seek a church that really obeys the Bible, not a church that is close to our house. But after persevering for three years, and it's very fun because it was exactly three years, my mom got baptized. It was a great experience to see that she could finally appreciate my change. I was very happy. She's a disciple today. She's loyal for two years. She's a disciple already for two years. And it's just great to see how many things God is doing with us together. We share scriptures with each other. We're even closer than before. So I would like to inspire everybody to fight for your family. Don't feel insecure because these people are those who know you best, who know your sins best. Don't feel ashamed because of that, but show to them your light. Show that you changed. And this way will bring a lot of glory to God, to Jesus, and also will convert your family and be with them in heaven. Thank you so much and to God be the glory. Amen. Uh, greetings, brothers and sisters. Uh, the charge that has been given to me, my name is Raul Moreno, is sickness or death in the family. Well, uh, uh, some people know that my father was diagnosed a couple months ago with terminal brain cancer. So I want to talk especially about sickness in the family. He was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. I live in Sao Paulo in Brazil. My mom and dad live in Miami, Florida. They're retired there. So when I heard this, I immediately flew to Miami to be with my dad. I'm the only child. And for his whole life, he's been very close to the gospel. Not open at all. In fact, out of all my family members, he is the closest one to not wanting anything to do with Jesus. But the sickness made him really softer for the Lord. And he studied the Bible. He repented, he studied with Mike, Matt Sullivan, and he became a disciple, amen? Now, now the cancer's taking his toll, he, he's slowly fading away, but he's a disciple, and he's going to go to heaven. Sickness in the family. What, what are some of the lessons that I learned from my dad getting baptized? Number one, I have, uh, I have quick points. Number one, unconditional love. 1 Peter 4, 8. We got to have unconditional love. What, what does that mean for me? I, I decided like four or five years ago, to call my father every single day. My father and my mother. Every single day I give him a phone call. It was rare that I missed, they missed my phone call. And I visited at least one, once, one time a year. And they saw the love. When you build that atmosphere of love, when they have a problem, they're going to go to you so you can help them. So I believe part of, of the reason he got converted is the unconditional love. My dad was not an easy person, neither was my mother. But I, I tried to love them unconditionally. And God blessed it. Number two, the collective prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints are powerful. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 10 to 11 says, As you help us by your prayers. When my dad was sick, I told everybody. And because of my um, position in leadership, in terms of leading uh, churches in South America, I had hundreds of people praying for my father in South America. And I believe those prayers opened my dad's heart. What is, what, what is one of the main things to save your, your sick family members? Get as many people as possible to pray for them. When someone asks you to pray for someone, take it seriously. Don't, don't ignore it. I know sometimes we've done that. I've done it. Yeah, yeah I'm going to pray for that person. And I forget. Really, you're lying. When, when you say you're going to pray for someone, pray for someone. Why? It makes a difference to save a family member. Collective prayers of the saints. Number three, when you have faith, deal with your doubts. Even in the midst of me having faith, I remember the scripture in Mark 9, 23 and 24. I believe, help me to overcome my own belief. Even though you believe, there's always an element of doubt there. But you have, and that's the element of doubt that you have to deal with. You have to really pray about that. So you can overcome that lack of faith. Yes, you have faith, but... 
I have faith. Help me to overcome my own belief. I had to really wrestle in prayer. Do I really believe he's going to become a disciple? And I did. And finally, number four, when you have a victory, deal with your pride. I had a victory. My dad became a Christian. James 1 says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. When you're blessed by God, it's not because you're awesome. It is, but it is not because you're so incredible, because you're so spiritual. It's really a blessing from the Lord. And if it's a blessing from the Lord, the Lord deserves the praise. The Lord deserves to be glorified. And He will be glorified. So these are some um, things that I've learned in saving someone who's sick. That's my dad. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen. What an amazing session we just had. My name is Danilo Bataglin and together with my wife, we have the privilege to lead the Lima International Christian Church. And first of all, I just want to thank you all the brothers who shared their hearts, who shared their convictions with us. And a special thank you to John Causey who preached the word for us and called us to have God's vision in our lives. You know, the word of God says in Ezekiel 33 verse 32, indeed, to them, you're nothing more than one who sings love songs with a beautiful voice and plays an instrument well, for they hear your words, but don't put them into practice. So that's pretty intense. These guys who just heard preaching, they were not singing love songs for us. They were not just playing the violin for us. They were calling us to obey God's vision in our life. So the worst thing we could do is to make no decisions. We gotta make radical decisions now after we have all this banquet of lessons. And as Tony Antoine and Benton, it's easy to be given a role, but not really embrace it. Today, with all those lessons, it was giving us God's vision. And now we have to embrace it. So guys, let's make radical decisions and let's help more men throughout the whole world to have God's visions and dreams as well. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, I just wanna thank you for this incredible opportunity that we have to gather together, even though virtually, Father, but to hear from your word, Father, to have your dreams and to have your visions accomplished in our lives, Father. Help us to make radical decisions and take this to our hearts, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.